Greetings friends. Welcome again to my game room. Hey, you know, there are some games that uh, were big hits in their period, but then they tended to just disappear, whether they fell out of favor, uh, were superseded by a better game of the same type. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, sometimes it's just through <laughs> mismanagement by the owner of the uh, game design itself. But what I have for you this week is a game that you may have heard of called Troke. Troke was uh, not just another flash in the pan, which by the way is a firearms reference, just in case you didn't know. But Troke was a game that was produced for a couple of decades, and uh, how it fell out of favor I'm not sure. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of the game, and uh, then we'll show you a little bit more here on the uh, actual board, how the game works, and uh, see if you'd like to give it a shot one of these days. The story starts back in 1933 with a fellow named Alfred Butts. And you might have heard of Alfred Butts before. But he was an architect and also a game player. He decided to uh, create a little game of his own back then. That was an anagrams crossword style game. He met with a fellow named James Bruno in the early 1940s. And Bruno and his wife Helen uh, were both game players and they had a chance to play that word game that uh, Alfred had come up with, and they liked it so much that they wanted to invest in it. And so they actually started their own company. It was called the Production and Marketing Company. Uh, it started in 1948 in their own home, and they took Alfred's game, and Bruno came up with the name Scrabble. Now, they manufactured these games themselves, and it was not long before the orders exceeded their capacity to fill. They got a lot of orders from Germany, which was always a big game-playing country. And uh, we go to a fellow there in Germany named Johann Schoenek. He had produced a little game there that was kind of an anagram game. And so they licensed Scrabble to Mr. Schoenek. And so now we steer back towards the game Troke. And the earliest reference I can find to the game Troke was game produced by Schoenek in Germany, according to the game board itself, says that it was licensed from the production and marketing company uh, that belonged to Bruno. Troke was created by James Bruno and a fellow named Arpad Rasti. Now, uh, Mr. Rasti was a world-renowned artist, uh, ceramicist, and uh, interior designer, and uh, they teamed up to come up with the the game called Troke. Now at that time it was spelled T-R-O-Q-U-E, which uh, has I guess a little more sophisticated look to it. And it was produced by Schoenek and uh, eventually made its way to some other European countries. Now another player comes into this story. It's, this again was another German fellow, his name was Selchow, uh, teamed up with another person named Reiter and we have Selchow and Reiter. They had their own line of games throughout the early part of the 20th century, but after World War II, they caught wind of this uh, game called Scrabble and said, you know, that's a pretty successful game. Uh, we can help you to meet those orders that you can't fulfill in your little factory up there in Newtown, Connecticut. And uh, Helen and James Bruno said, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, we will license the game to Selkow and Writer and uh, you can publish it uh, as long as our name is still on it and so on. Now, when SNR licensed the Scrabble game from the Brunos, they also apparently received the rights to produce their other game, which was called Troke with a Q-U-E. So that was in 1952 when the papers were signed. Uh, it took them a while to get around to publishing Troke, but the uh, first SNR version of Troke uh, was apparently in 1954. It continued to be refined a little bit after that. Finally, in 1956, Bruno and Rossi applied for a patent on the game, and that was awarded in 1959. SNR, they came out with the popular Blue Box and the, uh, the subtitle here that is Castle Checkers. And this is probably the most popular. They used, in fact, the same cover here for almost 10 years. But it was still produced in Germany as well. Uh, Egelspiel uh, produced their own version of it, still using the QUE. 
This is recognizable by the little hedgehog logo in the corner of the board and on the box. Entroke was published in several different countries besides Germany and the U.S. It was produced by Victoy in uh, Great Britain, which was a subsidiary of Invicta, Invicta Plastics, that produced the uh, Mastermind game. It was also produced in Australia by the Urban Company. Here's a picture of the Australian rule. Now the version I own here has uh, got a 1961 copyright date on it. Uh, and it was very popular there in the early 60s. They changed the board design a little bit, changed some color scheme, but essentially it was the same. It was one of the first games that had a plastic insert like this for the pieces. Uh, in fact, apparently it was such a novel idea that in the instructions printed on the inside of the box top here, it says, Suggestion. The plastic container which holds the playing pieces is intended to store them when not in use and should not be discarded or destroyed. Now in 1967 the uh, SNR company decided that they were going to emphasize a little bit more the castle checkers uh, moniker and so they changed the artwork of the board to uh, emphasize that medieval feeling to it and so we came out with this one. Uh, they produced that for a couple of years. Well now let's go back to 1966 for just a second. There was a pretty well-known game company you probably have heard of called Milton Bradley. Uh, they came out with a game called Siege. And Siege was produced all over the world. A uh, simple little castle defense game, what we call simple today. And it was published here in the States, of course. It was also published in Great Britain, uh, in Germany, and in France. The reason I bring up Milton Bradley's game Siege is this. Looks quite familiar, doesn't it? Now, why Selchow and Ryder would come up with this cover art with the name change of Siege, I'm not sure. It wasn't Siege. It was Troke. But it was Troke in a familiar packaging style, but with the name Siege and still called Castle Checkers. I don't know, it's confusing. And apparently it confused the buying public as well. And by about 1970, uh, the game Troke was not in their catalog anymore. Now, the game made a pretty good run, you know, 20 years. It wasn't too bad. Um, Seltrow and Ryder, on the other hand, didn't do so well later on. Uh, they were finally bought out by Coleco uh, in 1986 for $75 million. And I wonder whether they also inherited the rights to Troke. I'm not sure of that. We won't see it in print anymore. But it is a fun and challenging game. Now, all that history leads us up to this version of Troke, which is 1961, which is essentially the same game that was produced uh, all the way up until about 1968-69. So let's talk about the rules a little bit and how do you play Troke. Troke is one of those uh, games that I call from here to there games. It is set up so that each player is on one side of the board and they're striving to get to the other side of the board. But there's a bit more to it in this case. Now the main thing you'll notice is that each set of pieces, like the red, the green, there's also the blue and the yellow, consist of these little castles, they call them, with three pieces in each castle. The tallest piece is called the tower, the next tallest piece is called the wall, and the final piece is the moat. And you put the three together and you end up with a castle. Pretty logical stuff. Now you're going to try to get your castle disassembled and move along the board through the points and lines until you get over to the opposite side of the board. Each player's starting position has a ring and a circle. The ring indicates the starting position color and the circle is the ending position which is the player on the other side of the board. And the game ends when one player gets all four of their castles reassembled on the other side of the board. But that player is not necessarily the winner of the game. The winner of the game is the person who has acquired the most points. Now you'll notice that I have on the board here some chips. Each player starts with a set of 12 chips of their own color. And these chips represent the points in the game. And every time a piece captures an opponent's piece, that opponent has to give them a chip. 
They earn points by capturing. Capturing is a little different in that you're not actually taking anything off the board. Now let me show you some examples. Each piece moves on the board one space at a time, following the lines from point to point. So for example, let's take one of the green pieces and we move a tower one space. Simple enough. Now on the next move, let's say here we'll take red, we'll move a tower out one space. Over here I can take another tower, I can move out one space. Okay, well this is going to take a long time. But check this out. The red player takes the wall, moves it to the tower like this. Now I have effectively captured my own piece. This, I captured one piece, this allows me to make one extra move following the lines. Okay, catch that? So now I can take a tower here, or I mean a wall, from the green, do the same kind of thing and move out like so. They move together, and because I took that piece, I can move one extra space. Now, I haven't captured anybody else's pieces, so I don't get any points from that, but I do get the bonus move from that. Now, when you play with two players, you play opposite sides and cross over to the other end of the board. If you play with three players, then you obviously have uh, one space that's not occupied. That gives that third player a slight advantage because there's nobody on the other side directly working against them. And when they get to that other goal on the other side of the board, there's nobody waiting for them there. Uh, but four players play, four players place the game, and the board gets pretty crowded after a while, and it gets a little bit tricky in there. I think two players plays pretty well. With two players, the home rows on the other two sides of the board are off limits, so you just basically ignore them. and It shrinks the board down a little bit and uh, keeps it a little bit more streamlined. So I think the two-player version is really the one that uh, is, is the most exciting and the most fun. So I fast forwarded a little bit here and I've got a game that's kind of in progress just at that point where the two players are about to interact with each other. And uh, so I just wanted to show you a few of the moves and uh, how you gain points from the, the play here. So I can take that green wall and move it to where the tower is. Now I've captured a piece so I get to have an extra move, but it's my own piece so I don't get any points for it. But because I've got an extra move now, I move here, which captures a red moat. And so I get a red chip. And now I've got one more move there because I've captured another piece. So I will move it here. All right. I have a situation with red wherein I can move here. Captures one of my own pieces so I can move again. Green has a situation where I can move my tower and then move the moat to here. Red doesn't have a whole lot of options here for capturing. But I can do a little blocking here. I can move that moat over here so that eliminates that as a path that the green player can take with a moat. But I can still move the green player with the tower which captures that moat. Now I said early on, or I believe I said early on, that pieces can't move backwards. You can only move towards your goal, not back. But in this case, the green tower captured the red moat and moved it essentially backwards. That's the only way pieces can move backwards. And that can be very powerful because you can drag another of your opponent's pieces a couple of spaces back and uh, foil their plans and drag them around. Um, very intriguing aspect of the game. Oh, that gave me another point too, so I got two points now. So let's see. I think I will move the red tower here out to the forefront, see what that gets me. Uh, green, on the other hand, I can pull this over here and completely foil that plan. Gets me another point. Come on, red player, you're not doing much. Uh, okay, let me get this. Get this mode out of here. 
green will move over there. Now you'd think that was keeping things open for red, but it doesn't really, because of the configuration over here, red could take the towers and move that green moat around a little bit, but it's not the best choice of moves over there. Um, so I think red's going to just continue to move some pieces out into the board. Here captures two of my own pieces and therefore get two extra turns like so. I could take this green piece, capture that red wall, which gives me an extra turn, which allows me to capture my own moat, which gives me an extra turn so that I could move it over to here. So there's a chain reaction thing going on there. I did capture a piece, so I would get another point for that. Um, now my red tower could capture that wall, move back over here to capture my own moat, which would give me the opportunity to move this direction and move that tower back. Uh, I made a capture, so I get to another point. So some of those little chain reaction things can be really, really powerful to change the face of the board in a big hurry. Pretty well locked in here without a lot of possibilities. Um, this uh, wall is pretty much exposed though. So the green could capture the wall and move this direction, which gets another point, which is the point of the game, so to speak. But now red has the opportunity to capture two green pieces in one move and move them way back here to the back line. So that gives two points for that move. And again, changes the board drastically. Now your own goal line, like this is the green goal line, um, has some unique aspects to it. One is that you can move laterally across um, that goal line to re distribute your castle pieces, um, but you can't be captured. You can capture an opponent's piece there, but you can't complete a castle if you still have one of your original pieces on your starting line. So you have to move those pieces off the starting line before you can assemble castles. And one other aspect of that is that the first player to assemble a castle receives a point from all their opponents. Now, a two-player game, that's one. But uh, if you're playing a four-player game, you get three points for doing the first castle. The second castle to be built, whichever player that was, gets two coins from each player. The third is three coins. The fourth is four coins. And now that you have four castles built on your home or your goal row, uh, the game's over and you just start count up your points earned. So it encourages capturing rather than just doing the end run and racing to the goal. You could end the game and lose miserably if you didn't collect enough points along the way. Now I might have missed a rule or two in that explanation, but uh, you'll get the idea of how the game works and how it plays. There are some variations. One of them is that you can completely play it just as a Chinese checker style game and just the whole point is to get from here to there and there's no points earned in it at all. Um, another way that you can do it, and in fact, apparently the original rules said that when you capture a tower, you get one point. You capture a wall, you get two points. And if you capture a moat, you get three points. So that would definitely shift the uh, scoring a lot during the game as well. Now here's a little epilogue to this story. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, when I was just beginning to dabble in the idea of inventing my own games, um, I came up with an idea that was a uh, variation on a Chinese checkers sort of a mechanism to get from one side of the board to the other. I decided that I would come up with a game that worked on a hexagonal grid of sorts that uh, would include pieces that contained three parts and you had to get from one end of the board to the other and reassemble those three parts. Now I called the game Star Castles and this was my packaging at the time and uh, I created this little game so that each Star Castle, each rocket ship would have three pieces to it and here's the board with pieces assembled here. This looks so familiar. 
Now, the weird thing is, I don't know if I ever saw a troke at that time. I must have seen it at some point, but it didn't really register with me that that's what I was doing, was recreating that game. It has the same three pieces. It has the same grid of lines and points and the same objectives to the most part. I didn't have points for the captures. I didn't have captures, literally. Um, landing on a piece that was um, inside another, the inside piece, would simply trap that other piece so it wouldn't move. So you, you're not capturing and moving opponent's pieces, you're just stopping them. I also came up with these little gems um, I can't remember what I call them now, energy gems or something like that, that you could seed onto the board that would make a space off limits. The, the game works. The game works with six players. Uh, it also works with two. You can also play teams. You can play one player against another with two or three different space fleets and uh, really make it work. So that was Star Castles. As I say, I just don't remember that I had even seen or played Troke before I came up with this game. But it's been in the box for 40 years, and I haven't done anything with it yet. But I might, someday, you might see a game called Star Castles, which looks vaguely like Troke. But if you'd like to play Troke, um, you can probably find it at a thrift store, antique store, uh, of course eBay. Uh, there's a lot of places that you can track down copies of Troke and uh, make your own if you're so inclined, and uh, give it a try. And someday maybe we'll play a six-player version here uh, for Star Castles and see how that works out as well. But meanwhile, whatever you play, be sure to play.